Right, so that brings us to the last presentation, and that is uh, going to be delivered by Captain uh, Indian Navy Jaydeep Avinash Bolankar, who is the Chief Test Pilot of the National Flight Test Center uh, here. Uh, the topic that he is going to be speaking to us about is the flight testing, the LCA Navy for ski jump launch. And uh, we are aware that that comes with a set of problems for which solutions have to be found of its own. We have, we have just seen one of the videos um, of uh, carrier launch uh, and uh, uncontrollable situation in the previous presentation. And that is just one of the several problems that could be encountered by in, in situations like this. Of course, in, uh, in the Navy, is uh, already operates um, a very fine aircraft carrier with uh, a fine uh, fighter aircraft on board and also is well placed to induct um, a new aircraft carrier with the MiG-29. So there is going to be a considerable amount of work that will require to be done by uh, test pilots like the captain. And um, so he's going to be speaking to us uh, on, on this aspect of the ski jump launch, flight testing, uh, the LC in this particular instance, which is also going to have a naval version uh, coming up and it will require extensive testing in this situation. A few words about the, the, um, um, the presenter. Captain Molankar uh, is an ex-NDA for National Defense Academy of the 60th, 66th course. He was commissioned in 85, and after that he got his pilot's wings in, in 1987. He has done his staff college at Wellington, and he served as an executive officer on a ship called INS Magar. He's also commanded two ships, a frigate INS Udegri and a missile frigate INS Ganga. It was one of the um, processes through which all pilots like him in the Indian Navy have to pass through, as indeed all other navies as well. He belongs to the fraternity of the first fighter squadron of the Navy, the White Tigers, also the INAS 300. Uh, he's flown the Sea Harrier, uh, spent eight and a half years in the squadron, and has had the privilege of commanding the squadron as well. So that qualifies as the fourth command. Um, he is a graduate of the Air Force's Test Pilot School, and he topped uh, in, in one facet uh, during the um, Test Pilot's course and he backed the COAS's trophy for flight evaluation. Uh, he has done um, test work on the Sea Harrier, which belongs to the Indian Navy, and also has been um, involved with the LUSH, or limited upgrade of the Sea Harrier for the Indian Navy. Uh, he's now posted to the National Flight Test Center in Bangalore as a test pilot uh, on the light combat aircraft, which the Navy is also going to induct in a short while from now. Uh, he's been with the organization for almost four and a half years. And with this kind of an experience, I think he's very well placed. And also with his um, Sea Harrier experience, very well placed to speak to us on this topic of flight testing the LCA Navy for ski jump launch. So over to the captain. Can I have slides on? Slides on the screen, please. No, no, slides on the screen, please. Yeah. It's 610. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the privilege of being the last speaker of the day. Uh, I, ex I think they always expect the Navy to compensate for everybody else's faults. So I think I'll do my bit. I'll try and keep it short. I must confess I was not a volunteer for this job of presenting to you. And I'll explain to you why. Normally, test pilots like to talk about stuff that they have done already in the past and not about stuff that uh, they're going to do. But uh, considering the amount of national treasure that we've expended on this program on that we're going to be expanding on this program, and the fact that it is a pretty, uh, pretty ambitious uh, program to take this aircraft, the first fighter that we built in about 40 years, and not only are we going to make it the lightest, but we're also going to put it on an aircraft carrier, and that to a medium-sized aircraft carrier, not, not something very big, which is nice and stable. So um, it's a pretty aggressive program, uh, and therefore I think uh, the audience deserves to know what, uh, what we are planning for it, and uh, try and give you a idea about uh, do we really know what we're talking about. So I'll, I'll start with uh, just giving you a short overview on what the LCA Navy program is as compared to 
the LCA uh, Air Force, as we like to call it. Uh, the Air Force calls it Tejas. Uh, we call it LCA Air Force, just to differentiate in all our documentation. But I'll just try and highlight some of the differences and uh, spend a little time on the prototype. Uh, here I'll talk about some of the stuff which uh, where we realized we, we learned uh, uh, and we had to fix our problems along the way itself uh, because of the definition of the program. Uh, thereafter, we'll get into the ski jump test plan as such and how we intend to go about it. And I'll also spend a little bit of time on uh, some of the facilities that we are uh, building. Uh, there's a fair amount of effort and money being expended on the shore based test facility in uh, Goa. I think uh, it's pretty luxurious for the scale of the program that we are trying to run. So it, uh, it does merit uh, coverage here. Uh, the LC Navy program was uh, envisaged as an offshoot of the Air Force program. Of course, it was sold uh, to everybody as a minimum change program. And as everybody knows, that can never happen. It can happen the other way around. Uh, unfortunately, we chose to do it uh, from land-based to, to carrier-based rather than the, uh, the other way around. Uh, notwithstanding that, it was sold as uh, a program involving just two aircraft. It has since grown and it will involve uh, many more. But for the moment, uh, we have two aircraft uh, with us to handle. Uh, one which is already rolled out and pretty soon uh, should be put into the air. And the other one, which uh, that is the uh, fighter, which uh, will come up uh, towards the end of the year. The first aircraft is a trainer. And uh, why is that so? Because of, uh, because of r resources for development, it was, it was elected that rather than developing uh, four separate aircraft, that is the Air Force fighter, Air Force trainer, Navy fighter, Navy trainer, in that sequence, which would have been the more uh, conventional sequence, uh, it was decided to club it into something like a two and a half aircraft program, which is uh, Navy, uh, correction, uh, Air Force fighter, <coughs> Navy trainer, for which would have an offshoot in terms of Air Force trainer, and also be back converted into Navy fighter. So it's a little different. Uh, it has come with its own uh, problems. Uh, interestingly, the MiG-29, as I understand, is also a very similar, MiG-29K is also a very similar concept, wherein the trainer is the, is the master aircraft and the, the fighter is an offshoot of that. Uh, also, one structural test specimen. Uh, more excitingly, a uh, full range of test facilities, uh, uh, whether they be test rigs in Bangalore or the shore-based test facility at Goa. And uh, the one-line mandate, the Navy likes to keep <coughs> things very simple. They give one-line mandate to the people on the, on the deck. And uh, that is flight test to carrier compatibility. Demonstrate to us that the aircraft is fit to go uh, to sea and uh, we'll buy it. The uh, program is not, uh, it's not the first. It's not pioneering work. Uh, definitely, we are completely new to this game of designing uh, aircraft to go on to aircraft carriers. But uh, it's still different. It's still unique in a, in a sense that we're trying to combine uh, ski jump takeoff which uh, has not been done too often with uh, certainly with um, uh, you know uh, flyby wire aircraft and uh, certainly not with uh, unstable deltas and uh, of course the conventional arrested landing uh, why i'm highlighting this is because uh, while there is a huge body of literature and huge body of experience and a lot of documentation available about arrested recovery unfortunately the us navy let us down for ski jump because they don't seem to take care very much about it so that's an area where we're going to be on our own. And that's why in this uh, particular talk, I'm concentrating more on, on ski jump because the arrested recovery will, will be uh, basically reading out from, the, uh, from all the guidelines that they've got from the US Navy. Moving on to the aircraft, like I said, it was supposed to be a, a minimum change from the Air Force trainer. So what you see is looks uh, a lot like the Air Force trainer, except for the fact that it's got an additional surface here. Uh, not too clear out here, but th th that's what it looks like in this wing root section. Uh, Levcon leading edge vortex control, basically a destabilizing surface, which would result in, uh, when the flight control compensated for it, would result in uh, a lower uh, approach speed. Uh, also, a much flatter, uh, much flatter weight versus uh, approach speed curve. That's an interesting offshoot. I'm waiting to see that, wherein uh, weight doesn't seem to make too much of a difference to uh, the approach speed. I don't believe it too much. The designers insist it, it ha it'll happen. Let's see. Uh, landing gear, of course. Uh, it is over-designed, uh, clearly, and that's one of the problem areas wherein uh, probably we need to fine-tune our designs. Uh, this clearly is uh, its too strong, I think, which is great for the test pilots running the uh, development program. I'm not so sure it's great when it comes to building an operational aircraft, and uh, why I'll, I'll tell you how it, has been, how it has been built into the program subsequently. Of course, an arrestor hook, 
since all of these were to be scaped on to an existing um, uh, platform, uh, it, uh, it uh, obviously required a strengthened uh, structure. It was decided to restrict all changes to center fuselage only and that was, uh, that is pretty limiting in the sense that um, uh, the undercarriage becomes, uh, it looks like one of those uh, uh, WWF uh, wrestlers, it's got, it's got very strong uh, biceps. I'm not so sure, sure that's, that's a very elegant uh, design because undercarriage, the under, main undercarriage had to continue to be attached to the same attachment points, the same frame uh, rather than the attachment point drifting outboard. We've, we've, we've had our say and uh, we've had our way with uh, what we call the Mark II aircraft and therefore uh, before the aircraft is really flown, it has been accepted that there will be a, a revised undercarriage. Uh, we would therefore be looking at this part of the program more as a technology demonstrator with a limited operational capability feeding into a, a Mark II program, which would have everything fixed, which I think is the right way to go. Uh, it was probably too ambitious to go from uh, no aircraft to uh, carry on aircraft straight away. Uh, the program, therefore, as of now, looks like this. We've got a, we've got a strong uh, carrier compatibility uh, element to it. And uh, side by side, we also have to keep going with uh, the Navy specific weapon and sensors because we have to produce an aircraft which, which does some good work and not just, uh, not just flies around over the sea. And we hope that all of this will, put, uh, will give us an aircraft which has a reasonable uh, operational capability. It's certainly not uh, something to be uh, scoffed at, uh, but it is not what uh, uh, the Navy wants for 20 years from now. And therefore, they insisted that we go for, a, for, a, uh, for increased thrust, which would give us uh, the lightest multi-role aircraft, which is, which is still very, very ambitious. But it would also give us an opportunity to... Uh, it would also give us an opportunity to uh, feed in refinement from everything that we learn in the carrier compatibility uh, development as well as testing. It would allow us to feed all that into uh, the aircraft which finally incorporates uh, everything which has a prettier looking undercarriage also. Uh, as a result of the developmental activity, we've realized the limitations of the original definition of the, pro of the, of the aircraft. And uh, therefore what's happened is that Whatever we've been able to fix within the first aircraft, we've done so. Whatever couldn't make it in time for the first aircraft has slipped to the second aircraft. And uh, whatever could not be accommodated within these two have slipped to what is called the Mark II. So it primarily relates to the, uh, the undercarriage, but the, the basic uh, characteristics, therefore, of the NP-1 is that it's pretty similar to the Air Force two-seater. And uh, with the addition of the Levcon, you can see the undercarriage is, is significantly different. That's going to require a lot of testing. But that's, that's, a, that's besides the uh, topic for today's uh, talk. The uh, structures, this is the first cut design for the Navy undercarriage. And uh, it has the strengthened uh, center fuselage. Uh, unfortunately, the intake is the standard Air Force intake. And therefore, we are, uh, we are being limited to an intake which is designed to be buzz free up to 1.8 Mach. But it's starving the engine at uh, low speeds, which is the uh, ski jump launch uh, semi-ballistic phase. And therefore, we have liked to have more thrust here. But uh, we couldn't put it in, into the first aircraft. We have only managed to get uh, an additional uh, uh, offset of the T5 from the engine. So we're going to get a little more thrust, but the engine is still going to be a little bit starved. And therefore, that's going to be fixed on um, the first fighter, which is NP2, which will have an improved uh, air intake. Uh, everybody likes to put in uh, their favorite aircraft's uh, design features into their next aircraft. And therefore, I think the letterboxes of the sea area we've, we've pushed into this. Uh, it's going to be there on, uh, we're going to have a, a lot more thrust on uh, the NP2. I think it'll do better displays uh, than the current Air Force uh, aircraft too. It will also have the uh, full suite of Navy specified avionics. The Navy was pretty clear about uh, their avionics suite that they wanted. They gave us a very clear definition. So we've, we've uh, put the full set in into the uh, NP2. It's also got increased internal fuel as compared to both the um, trainer, of course, and uh, also as compared to the Air Force fighter. So that should yield us some, uh, uh, some benefit in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of meeting the uh, mission figures, mission performance figures that the Navy specified. This was an offshoot of, uh, during the development process, uh, the flight test team fighting for more and more uh, fuel. The Navy permits us to do this uh, fairly freely. Uh, we can hop to whichever side of the fence uh, we feel like. Uh, as as uh, I think uh, my colleague specified, when you keep the program small uh, and allow decisions to be taken at the working level, it does help a lot. 
Uh, moving on to the ski jump test plan, we've split into two parts, which is basically uh, on the SDTF, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later, which is basically a, a ramp and a rest gear ashore, and uh, also the uh, a float test. The uh, objectives that we've been that have been given to us is basically starting with demonstrate feasibility that the LCA Navy can go up the ski jump, which means any weight, any store configuration, show that you can do it, show that you have the uh, you have uh, the expertise in flight control to be able to handle this uh, phase of flight. Thereafter, uh, the route would be primarily to make the aircraft fly like it flies on the simulator, and therefore we have to keep the model of the uh, the simulation model. Uh, I mean, the uh, the model on the simulator more accurate than uh, and use that to predict where we can go. Use that to validate the flight control strategy, and thereafter expand the envelope on the on the uh, actual aeroplane. We would thereafter also be validating the loads analysis because these are all the various limitations, the flight control capability, the loads capability, uh, what are going to limit, how much we can get airborne from the uh, from the ski jump. Uh, there is also the minor issue because we are planning to operate her off uh, a restraining gear which is hydraulic chocks basically. So uh, the interaction with that should not yield too many surprises but never say never. So uh, it might just be something uh, pretty interesting. Uh, when it comes to the afloat phase, uh, that is where we hope to be able to demonstrate the full performance capability of the of, of the Navy fighter. Uh, I feel, at least as far as uh, launches are concerned, uh, I think testing afloat ought to be safer than uh, testing ashore. Basically, you can build in excess wind on deck and uh, convince yourself before you get down to really the critical fight conditions. So uh, we really hope to uh, do the really critical performance work uh, afloat. The uh, ashore phase will be more subject to vagaries of the ambience that we can get. I think it's much more controlled at sea. Uh, Arabian Sea in winter is, is just great. Uh, thereafter, we will also demonstrate integration with the shipboard equipment. We will demonstrate a wind, wind on deck envelope. Uh, Shore-based facilities have this limitation that you can't really demonstrate a wind on deck envelope too much, uh, too well, certainly in terms of crosswind and the higher uh, wind speeds. And uh, the big bugbear, which is ship motion. Ship motion is going to be something which we are going to have to approach with extreme caution. Uh, we do not have experience with it. And uh, when we have tried to follow all the guidelines, we've ended up with an over-designed undercarriage. So obviously, we need to shave off and we need to be a lot less conservative. That's an area which, uh, therefore, the ship motion testing is, uh, I suspect, going to result in uh, uh, either a compromised aircraft or a broken aircraft. At least one of the test aircraft is going to break. That's something we have to accept. And uh, if we accept it and move forward from there, I think we'll be a lot better. Uh, Ex-president of SETP is looking at me and waiting to see if I slip up. I'm not going to. Uh, anyway, uh, we are also hoping to make it all weather. I think uh, the, the, the uh, expertise that we have developed in flight controls allows us to do some interesting things. Uh, I think we'll go to sea with an autothrottle. I think we'll go to sea with a, with a really good autopilot. I think we'll be able to do uh, uh, a lot to make this aircraft uh, all weather uh, afloat. I'm not so sure it'll work well off, uh, you know, in the roaring 40s, but we'll get there. Maybe 10 years from now, we'll get there. The uh, building blocks, obviously, before we get into the ski jump test plan, there's a lot of work to be done for uh, data validation, uh, primarily in terms of thrust data. We need to run a high alpha program, which is out of sync with the rest of the, uh, rest of the Air Force program in the sense that we need to do the high alpha program right in the beginning, rather than use it uh, to expand into it uh, subsequently. We're going to have to do it right in the beginning, at least for the uh, speeds which cover the uh, launch phase. We're going to have to investigate uh, the landing gear dynamics. Unfortunately, since we're going to have to revise the gear, so we're going to have to do it twice uh, for the newer gear also. Uh, we're trying to build a hands-free takeoff. We try to keep it really simple, uh, exactly the same evolution uh, pattern as the what was done for the Sea Harrier, wherein uh, very complicated strategies are resulting in uh, uh, very marginal or ne or negative uh, performance implications. And uh, finally, pilots finding a very simple strategy, theta capture, hold it, and you get a pretty simple, uh, non-disorienting kind of uh, uh, launch. Uh, we've basically tried to adapt that into the flight control so that you get a hands-free with, uh, with very minimal tricks from the engineers. Uh, it looks good on the simulator. Uh, I hope it uh, works out that way on the uh, actual aircraft. The launch hard formats, uh, I think we shouldn't need too many. We, we tr investigated some pretty complicated patterns. I'm not so sure that they're required. Uh, I don't think we'll go off with those things in the beginning at least. And uh, once you get used to it, I think 
uh, we just can try and keep the HUD uh, very simple. Uh, just added this one last bullet with a question mark. Uh, jettisonable ventral stall. This is something that we're trying to push for, uh, wherein we go into the uh, initial launch program itself with a jettisonable stall uh, as part of the config of the aircraft. Basically, it's instant performance. The moment you get uh, get rid of it, it's uh, instant. Uh, it's an instant safety cushion. Uh, it's just that it doesn't sit very well with management. Uh, putting a ventral store uh, so early into the program is something that uh, it upsets a lot of timelines. We're going to have to fight for this, but uh, let's see if we can get this in. <coughs> uh, this is what our ski jump test plan looks like in terms of uh, uh, the SBTF launch, and it's a pretty similar thing for uh, for the uh, float phase also. We've got the building blocks uh, where when we uh, do all the initial work, preliminary work. I think chronologically it should work this way, that we do the building blocks. We may have to revisit some of them uh, uh, a little bit later, but basically we can do the building blocks and thereafter go to the initial demo uh, on the basis of uh, a most conservative, uh, very safe, lightest possible, ideal conditions kind of a, kind of a takeoff, which allows us a first uh, update of our simulator model. Thereafter, everything is hinging about around uh, update and revalidation of the simulator model, where it, uh, with respect to either performance or loads or flight controls. These three are the, are the limiting factors in terms of reaching uh, flight controls uh, limits as far as the flight control system is concerned or reaching uh, loads limits as far as the structures are concerned or uh, performance limits in terms of our, of, of our uh, flight path that we've uh, defined, minimum flight path uh, acceptable. So this would be the heart and every module would keep feeding into it as, as is shown here. Uh, so that each time you are passing through the simulator update, before you move to the next phase. So uh, initially we look to, we hope to uh, validate our performance analysis. I'll just move forward to make it, make it a little faster. Uh, basically we will initially uh, decrease our launch roll uh, to validate our performance analysis without really increasing the weight of the aircraft. So we still have some excess. Thereafter we'll increase the all of weight to uh, finally demonstrate the performance capability. Uh, are our projections correct? Of course, subject to what the uh, ambience at, this, at the SBTF uh, permit us. So this, uh, while it would satisfy the technical requirements of demonstrating the capability, I'm not so sure it will impress the customer because the customer likes to see uh, actual loads, actual uh, weights. Uh, I'm not so sure that you know uh, customers really believe uh, graphs too much. They like to see aircraft actually doing it. So that part, part is probably going to have to wait uh, to go to see. Uh, thereafter, we're going to increase the launch role so that we start uh, loading the structure that much more. And uh, a combination of these two should allow us to demonstrate what we think this configuration of aircraft uh, can do. And all our projections for float operations, are they correct uh, or not? But uh, I think the, the proof of the pudding is really going to be when we take it afloat. And you'll find it's a very similar thing with a little offshoot of uh, demonstrating compatibility with the uh, restraining gear. We hope to get the restraining gear ashore also but uh, that, may, uh, that may or may not uh, really work out well because the practicality, the pressure of, uh, of deck operation, I think uh, uh, the stress of operating within the confines of a flight deck is highly underrated. And uh, uh, marshallers are known to be the rudest people in the Navy. So uh, I think it's a little underrated, uh, the, the uh, underestimated, the problems of people you know, uh, running into restraining gear too fast or uh, uh, bouncing over it, damaging the gear, uh, I think they are underrated, so therefore I'm, I'm putting this in as a bullet. Uh, with the ship, we're going to have to do it in a similar manner, basically decreasing the uh, wind on deck, increasing the all of weight, pushing the, pushing the performance to its uh, limits. Uh, there is also going to be a, a module on high wind on deck, which is in terms of turbulence and uh, crosswind, uh, flight control system being able to handle it. Uh, classic gusting doesn't occur very much at sea, but uh, vortices shedding from the, uh, from the ship structure are going to be uh, a problem. And therefore, we've added the high wind on deck uh, portion. Uh, specifically, there, we're not going to be able to do it uh, sure. So this is something we're, we're going to learn the hard way. Ship motion. This is the part which I hope I will have retired before the aircraft actually does it. Uh, I've seen, uh, I've just commanded a frigate. We went down uh, into the roaring 40s, and uh, we did an exercise for a month there. So I'm not looking forward to that. I hope somebody will put up his hand and volunteer unlike me, and uh, do this. This is the part which is going to require uh, a very cautious, uh, a lot of belief in uh, our instrumentation, because the, the moment uh, 
some strain gauge shows something which people don't understand. Normally, everybody suspects the strain gauge rather than suspecting the load path uh, calculation. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be a big uh, learning curve for us to be able to really push something to its limit, uh, especially when there is a probabilistic element to how much loading actually is acceptable. I mean, a one-time uh, uh, not exceeding your one-time limits is, is easy, but to qualify the aircraft to say that it can routinely do this and still be acceptable, uh, it's going to be uh, interesting work. Uh, moving on to the shore based test facility. Uh, this is the uh, airfield at uh, Goa, fantastic airfield for testing. It's right next to the sea. You have uh, mountains on one side and you have uh, sea level on the other, sea on the other side. Bird free atmosphere, huge big uh, airspace. I think it's a fantastic place uh, they've chosen for uh, flight testing. They've chosen to build our shore based test facility there, which primarily is uh, a ramp, which uh, they've allowed us to mess up their parallel taxi track. At the end of it, we've got a ramp. Uh, and the good part is we've got 150 feet of cushion because there's a cliff down to the sea. So we've got 150 feet of, of cushion, which I'm not telling anybody about. Uh, but the, the flip side of it is we're going to have uh, updraft, a fixed updraft, which is going to instantly increase your angle of attack uh, if we wait for uh, higher winds. So uh, you, you win some, you lose some. <coughs> the, um, we're building a full-fledged arrestor gear and a runway to support it so that uh, even our uh, even our testing for uh, taxi in engagement, we have more than enough uh, you could to break a hook and still overrun. There's, there's a completely new uh, runway built. You can see uh, you can see the progress of the work. It's li this is a little, this photograph is about a few months old, so it's a little more advanced than this. And uh, we're getting a full uh, flight test center, full telemetry setup with uh, uh, the rest of your workshops, et cetera. So it's a, it's, a, it's a complete facility. I think it's very well uh, apportioned and uh, provisioned. And I think we should be able to do uh, not only not only uh, LCA flight test work, we should be able to do work for the for the MiG-29 for for upgrades, for example, expanding the envelope in terms of wallop weight, crosswind, uh, in terms of uh, asymmetric loading, uh, and uh, also as a training facility, which uh, of course uh, the Navy would be interested in. Uh, the ski jump is uh, it's a 14 degree ramp, uh, hyperbolic is what it's called, but it's it's basically almost circular. Uh, this is the load relief uh, area, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. This is where this is where the compressed oleos will extend over this portion, and therefore uh, that's an area of interest as far as as far as interestingly, undercarriage uh, on a ski jump doesn't break in compression. It always breaks uh, during its extension, uh, especially as the undercarriages get older. All uh, CRL problems that we've had have always resulted in the undercarriage falling off and not uh, compressing and compacting uh, itself. It's 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 a topic we can talk about uh, uh, we can talk about <laughs> about at length later. Uh, the ski jump on the ship is of course all metal. Uh, what we built uh, ashore is half concrete and uh, the rest of it is is metal. I hope that will not uh, change uh, any of the important characteristics. Uh, they promised us it won't, but uh, basically uh, to save cost is where uh, to save uh, uh, the amount of steel that is used. That's uh, that's been done. This is a photograph of uh, the equivalent in uh, uh, in uh, Ukraine, but uh, uh, this is exactly what it, what our ramp is going to look like. Our ramp is a little bit; uh, it's not yet at reached this stage. It should be th at this stage in a few months. Uh, moving on to the ski jump phenomena, uh, I've, I've, I've just listed out uh, all the kind of phenomena that we expect to capture during the ski jump testing. Uh, basically. The difference between conventional testing of uh, the Air Force aircraft here and uh, what we expect to have to do on the LCA Navy is that we're going to have to capture uh, interaction of the aircraft with the ground. And uh, aircraft sensors, that means sensors installed on the aircraft are not necessarily going to be good enough. Uh, the problem is even more exacerbated when we go to the arrested landing, but uh, certainly even for the, for the ski jump launch, we're going to have a, a lot of things which uh, would force us in the direction of photogrammetry. The ski jump launch is not so is not so sensitive to uh, uh, things that we, except for the load relief zone, which I spoke about, as the undercarriage extends as it goes off the ramp, uh, which would require uh, something like uh, something like a, a photographic or video solution. But uh, we are definitely going to have to uh, in, uh, develop a instrumentation scheme which is well beyond what we've done so far, which is integrating several external systems 
uh, ambience, uh, ground uh, uh, instrumenting uh, facilities on the ground and the aircraft and how they interact uh, together. Another major area is going to be uh, thrust. Now, thrust is something which uh, has been, uh, is a very, very important and a very powerful parameter as far as uh, ski jump uh, launch is concerned. Uh, the only other aircraft which really has done this is uh, the Sea Harrier where it's very, very easy to index a specific uh, aircraft. You just go and do a performance hover and you get to know exactly where this particular aircraft is at this particular moment with respect to the, uh, to the nominal engine that you have, that you have predicted. Now, uh, that's not going to be possible with, with, the, uh, with the LCA. And therefore, we're spending a lot of time and effort on building uh, thrust measurement algorithms. Uh, we're going to have to validate those. We're going to have to validate those with uh, tests in terms of uh, ground, roll, uh, ground roll uh, tests and uh, maybe even load cells uh, and, and chocks. Uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm not so sure that uh, we need to be very, very precise. But certainly, when we get to the limits of uh, performance demonstration from the ski jump, we're going to have to have a very good handle on thrust measurement. Uh, we hope, uh, at least I hope, that we're going to get a thrust number coming up on the, on the HUD, uh, just telling you how many kilonewtons of thrust you've got at this instant. And you expect to remember how much your graph is, uh, assumes that you have. And as long as it exceeds, you're good to go. Uh, that would be the ideal. I hope it works out uh, that way. Uh, velocities on the ramp, actual uh, velocities with respect to the ground uh, are, are important because that's what is going to determine the, determine the uh, loading. And uh, we're probably looking at laser speed trip. Uh, we're probably looking at photogrammetry, uh, especially in the zone where the undercarriage is relieving that load. And uh, that's something which may require a photogrammetry solution. Trajectory, uh, pretty simple. It's just that uh, we need trajectory uh, uh, instrumentation uh, with a fair degree of accuracy, especially when we get to close to uh, the limiting condition, which is a zero, uh, a zero rate of descent. Uh, more importantly, we should be able to retain telemetry, line of sight, even in case of a poor trajectory. And uh, really, the design point of the flight test center has been the, uh, the uh, eye position of the safety pilot and test director in the telemetry room, uh, that they are able to see the rest of the gear fit properly, and the uh, point at which the telemetry antenna. These are the two design points which we have personally controlled, and the rest of the building has been built around it. It's, uh, the ma it makes the building look a little bit uneven, but uh, these two points have been controlled specifically to make sure that we have a uh, telemetry line of sight even in a, in a worst case and uh, most degraded trajectory immediately after launch. Uh, similarly, as far as the ramp is concerned, ramps, uh, every time you build a ramp, it, it varies from what you intended to build it. Um, each ship is going to be different. Uh, the ramp that we are testing on is going to be different. And so really, it's going to be uh, uh, something that we, that we will have to uh, measure on the ramp. Landing gear, loads, stroke, strain, uh, these are something where, uh, where it's going to be uh, the bulk of the testing as far as proving that the aircraft can take uh, the weight and can take the, uh, can take the, uh, the uh, loads that we are putting on it is going to come from the loads. So I think uh, it's just the listing, it just gives you an idea about the kind of thought process that we have. I'm sure uh, this will develop and uh, in uh, later years, I suppose in next year's seminar or maybe the year after that, we'll be able to show you some uh, graphs of stuff that we've actually done. Uh, uh, flying qualities, I think, is pretty similar and fairly conventional. So there's nothing much to really talk about flying qualities, testing as such, uh, except for the fact that we uh, will probably need a little bit more measurement of the uh, wind flow pattern around that. It's another thing which we've not done uh, so far in terms of what is being shed by the, by the ramp. Uh, RGS integration, uh, like I've, I've spoken about this, I won't, I won't spend too much time. I can see everybody getting a little restless. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Captain Molanka, for uh, bringing us the challenges of, of flight testing of the LCA Navy and the ski jump situation. Um, we hope that the INS Virat today and the INS Vikram Aditya tomorrow are able to ride the Roaring Forties um, to much to the comfort of the people who succeed you in the um, test flying of the LCA Navy, which is bound for successful completion in any case. It has been undertaken. And uh, the thing that is, uh, the aspect that is really going to sort of clinch it for the LCA Navy is once again innovation and an intrepid attitude which is there 
in uh, full measure, uh, innovation, adaptability, uh, the thread that has run uh, through this entire four presentations that we have had, um, the final of which was yours, uh, is, uh, is, is something that is reinforced uh, d during this. I'm sure you will all agree uh, with this. Uh, so um, you know, with that, uh, I, um, I wouldn't have minded if you had a little time to permit about 10 minutes for questions, but I don't think that is the case. There are a lot of you who may have other engagements. Uh, so uh, once again, I reiterate that uh, uh, all the gentlemen here on the panel, the presenters, would be available, I'm sure, during the next few days during the Aero India. Uh, do engage them in discussion, uh, in, in clarifying your questions, because I think we have had a very invigorating, uh, uh, very uh, enlightening uh, presentations and uh, regarding flight testing, and uh, there, are, there would be any number of questions and discussion points that would emerge. So with that, I would like to uh, thank all the members on the panel, or the presenters, um, for um, excellent presentations. And of course, on my own, I would like to thank the seminar, um, the uh, people who have put it in place for affording me the opportunity of chairing this session. Thank you all very much.